Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another brand spanking new episode of The Unorthodox Social Worker, where we do talk about all things social work from an unorthodox perspective. Um, Isaac back here at you again, reporting live from San Francisco from the Fillmore District. As you can see, my uh, my tire blew out, so I had to take it off and uh, put on the spare. So that's why my, my tire and rim are sitting there in the back seat. But um, please do me a favor, whether you are new to this channel or whether you are already a uh, subscriber, please do me the favor, hit that like, hit that subscribe button, share the videos. It really helps me. Um, YouTube, get into the YouTube algorithm and expose this type of unique content to more um, people. So back to the topic at hand today, a very interesting topic, probably something I could talk about for hours on end, but it is what was it like to work in um, jail as a social worker? And um, me personally, when I worked in jail, I worked in Alameda County Jail which is uh, it's called Santa Rita Jail. I believe it's like the fifth largest jail in the nation. So it's uh, pretty much almost as big as some of these prisons. And Alameda County, Oakland, California is in Alameda County. So a big portion of inmates in Santa Rita are uh, coming out of Oakland, California. And the program I worked for, I uh, ran this program. It was a housing program four people coming out on what is called AB 109 uh, probation and uh, these grant would for my particular program assisted with helping finding securing and paying for some type of housing for those coming out of Santa Rita jail and before I go into this I want to do briefly explain what AB 109 is so AB 109 is a uh, bill passed by the California state uh, legislator, which basically says um, that the state does not want to take as punitive measures as it did in the past for those committing, committing nonviolent felonies. And a lot of people like to say those committing nonviolent drug felonies. So there is a whole slew of funding coming out of the state of California to fund um what we call re-entry services, services uh, geared towards helping people coming out of jail and prison to uh, better reintegrate into society. Um, I'm pretty sure the reason the state actually put this bill in place was because the state prisons were actually getting filled to capacity. There is not enough uh, places in jail to keep, in prisons to keep putting people the state's budget was strapped probably to build new prisons, so my guess is they built this, um, passed this legislation in order to reduce the prison population, and I guess by logic, they would want to let out the nonviolent offenders. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, when you come out in the state of California, they really don't have anything for you. All they have is a $200 and a bus ticket, but actually, if you are a non-violent felon and you do fall under this AB 109 criteria, there is actually a vast array of uh, re-entry services to take advantage of. But keep in mind, you know, if your crime was a violent felony, then you, uh, you're not able to access any of these re-entry services under um, AB 109. And again, my program that I ran through a nonprofit. So it's interesting that most of these homeless services grants are funded by HUD. And this program was actually funded by the state of California. So a little unique there. And I did notice maybe the audits, the oversight of this program was a little bit more lenient than maybe a HUD homeless housing program would be. So how did I get clients or how did I uh, get inmates, people coming out to um, participate in my program? So there was two ways. The first way would be I would actually go into Santa Rita County Jail or Alameda County Jail, uh, Santa Rita Jail, probably once or twice a week and conduct um, outreach, trying to um, outreach clients, uh, uh, prisoners or people in jail who would want to access these housing services once they got out. And before I get into this, you know, I don't want to go too deep into any specific story or expose too much you know some things are left uh better unsaid than said at all and you know by what i'm telling you you can come to your own conclusions about what types of things 
may go on in a jail or a prison setting. So I go to Santa Rita once or twice a week, checking at the front desk, and then you go through the first security checkpoint. I don't want to say too much about it, but all I'm going to say is that checkpoint was pretty easy to uh, get through. So you can come to the conclusion of what activities may or may not happen. Once I pass the first security checkpoint, I go down to what is called the reentry center, which actually used to be Santa Rita's um, basketball gym. So I'm in a big gymnasium. I'm there with other service providers, maybe people providing uh, employment services, education, uh, reconnection with family, things of that nature. I get a table. Any inmates um, in the jail who are who think they may need housing when they get out would notify their unit corrections officer or write a letter to the uh, corrections officer in the uh, transition center, which this gym is called the transition center. Um, it helps people transition out of jail. They could write a letter to the main deputy of the transmission transition center and they could see me. They come sit down with me. I explain to them the program where I can house them how I can help them search for housing or they can find housing themselves, um, what the financial limitations I can pay for their housing are, how long I can pay for their housing after they are released, and what they need to do to be compliant within their case plan to keep receiving ongoing assistance. So one option was inmates come to that transition center, they make an appointment, they see me, they talk to me, and then we arrange, you know, if they're interested in the program to, for them to contact their probation officer, get a referral to my program, and then we begin to start working. Now, let's say if it was a high security inmate, uh, maybe somebody like in uh, solitary or something like that, or simply certain inmates, you could say maybe because certain inmates couldn't be in the transition center at the same time, maybe they're enemies, maybe they don't get along. So in the case I'm not visiting an inmate in the transition center, pretty much I had free access to travel throughout this jail and go into any unit I needed to to see any of the prisoners who were interested in the program. And pretty much given free access to go walk around the jail unaccompanied by any deputy. You know, I'd see other inmates, other uh, corrections officers, nurses, janitorial staff, lawyers, so forth and so on. So it's not like there's just in jails and prisons, just inmates and corrections officers. There's mate, like I said, there's maintenance crews, there's medical staff, there's lawyers, there's a vast array of uh, people who could be in a in a jail besides a, co a police officer and an inmate. And once I would get to the unit I needed to go to, I'd ring the bell. The uh, corrections person in the tower of that unit would let me in. I'd usually go into the day room, which was kind of separated from the cells, and have that same conversation with the inmate. If it was a very high security inmate, you know, uh, then I would actually just be escorted up to the uh, client cell or the inmate cell, and I would conduct my uh, outreach effort with the client through the little flap in the um, door. And surprisingly enough, you know, before I... Cause I've never actually been uh, booked into jail, but don't get it wrong, you know, I do, I have been pulled over, stopped, you know, had had uh, cops pull me over and check to see if I was on paperwork more times than I can think. Um, but I've never been to jail, and I actually thought maybe going into the jail I might feel a little bit uncomfortable, uneasy, like maybe, who knows, maybe it would be a little bit dangerous. But surprisingly, I actually felt pretty comfortable in there. I never felt threatened. Um, I never felt uneasy. And that was actually a little bit um, surprising on um, my end. You know, keep in mind, I was able to go in there because I do have a clean criminal history, never been to jail. But some social workers actually um, are formerly incarcerated individuals. And I actually think that that may work out better in many cases because if the social worker goes in there and uh, tries to outreach or help people enroll in social services programs since they've been to jail or prison um, they can relate to the client what they're going through and a lot of times I think uh, someone who has actually been formerly incarcerated would be a better match 
to work with people as a social worker in jail than someone like myself who has never been um, locked up. So keep in mind, like I said, the first security checkpoint was pretty lax and you're given free reign to pretty much walk around the uh, jail and prison. Knowing those facts, you can guess what kind of uh, activities may go on in a prison facility or the compound. So when the clients got out or, you know, they'd call, they'd hit me up, I'd start working with them. And then again, you know, the other way I got clients is we had a, a, a partnership with Alameda County Probation. So if any probation officer who had a client who qualified under AB 109 probation and they thought that they may be needing of uh, housing services, as many people do in this very expensive uh, rental market of Bay Area in Alameda County, they would refer me um clients or you could say people on probation and I would begin to work with them to find housing. Now how was it like working with inmates? Um, it was pretty cool actually. For the most part there was a certain um, uh, amount of successes. I want to say the main barriers I saw when working with people coming out of jail, especially with the el more older people who have been pretty much in criminal justice system their whole life, a lot of times it was their addictions that held them back, whether it was a drug addiction, a addiction to prostitution, an addiction to gambling. These were the types of things that would um, cause a formerly incarcerated people to spend all their money on their addictions and not be able to sustain the income to pay their rent after I was unable to pay their rent any longer. And especially with the older individuals, I saw this more uh, prevalent with them rather than younger individuals. You know, uh, a lot of the younger guys were a little bit more ambitious, hadn't been, you know, the majority of their life in jail or prison, and they were actually able to be successful. And, you know, a lot of people talk about how recidivism, you know, the rate at which people return back to jail and prison is very high. I mean, I don't know what the... Uh, exact number is in California, maybe it's 80, 90 percent, something like that. But I could say that anybody who went through my program and during the time where they were still enrolled in my program, we had a very low recidivism rate. I think it was maybe 15 to 20 percent. So that really shows that if we do offer these re-entry services to people coming out of jail, then um, they have a much likely, higher likely chance of not returning to jail. And ultimately, it saves the taxpayers money because it actually does cost more money on the state to pay to house somebody in jail than it does to pay for their services to help them find employment, uh, go to addic uh, addiction recovery and housing and things of that nature. So I say that to say it's very important that we do um, continue these re-entry programs because it does, the stats show that it does reduce the chance of... Uh, inmates going back to jail. Now keep in mind the majority of my clients were coming out of county jail, not prison. Although I did have some parole officers. So remember, if you're coming out of jail, you're on probation. If you're coming out of state prison, you are on parole. Prison is typically the place you go to once you've been found guilty of the crime and you serve your time. Jail is typically the place you go to. You're still innocent. You're fighting your case. You're either going to be found innocent and let go, or you're going to be found guilty. With this new AB 109 law, if you are found guilty and are usually serving more than two years, you're going to be um, sent to prison. If your sentence is less than two years here in California, you're usually going to be doing your time in the county jail. So that is a shift that AB 109 brought within the um, state of California. So keep in mind, I did have people coming out of state prison. And my feeling was if a parole officer had nowhere to house somebody, they would automatically put that uh, inmate or person coming out of prison, not only on parole, but on probation as well. So I did get a few clients who were on parole and probation, and I was helping them finding them housing. And I could tell you there is a vast difference in the mental state of people coming out of jail than there was between the people coming out of state prison. People coming out of jail, though, they might may have uh, experienced some trauma. You know, they seemed pretty 
even-headed, pretty uh, even-tempered, you know, logical, all those things. Now, pretty much dang near every client I had coming out of uh, state prison, you could tell whatever happened to them in prison had a very big impact on their mental health. Um, it was almost like a wide-eyed deer in the headlights kind of look when I was dealing with people coming out of state prison. So it was kind of interesting to observe, you know, people going into sta California state prison, it must be a uh, crazy experience because the vast majority of them were coming out with what I observed, extreme mental health um, issues, you know, PTSD, you know, people being, you know, people that haven't seen a cabinet for 10 years, and then they're looking at the cabinet in my office and tripping that there's a cabinet, you know, tripping off basic normal things that people in the free world uh, don't even think about. So that is something to keep in mind. But overall, you know, we had a pretty good success rate, even though we couldn't house many people in their own apartments due to the fact that it's so expensive here in the Bay Area. I did have to house a lot of people in a single room or even a shared room, something that somewhat would more resemble a uh, halfway house than you would say permanent housing. Okay, now what was it like working with law enforcement? And keep in mind, me being a male, me being a person of color, growing up, you know, and living in urban areas, before I worked in this program uh, with law enforcement as a partner, my experiences with um, law enforcement were overwhelmingly negative. Like I said, I've been pulled over, questioned, detained way, way, way many more times than I can uh, remember. And every time I got pulled over, detained, stopped on the street, I never got arrested because I wasn't actually doing anything that crazy for them to arrest me. So at least, you know, I never got booked. But my overall perception of law enforcement was very negative because I thought, man, I always get pulled over, harassed by law enforcement. You know what I mean? I'm not down with law enforcement. Now, actually working in partnership with probation and in this case, the Alameda County uh, sheriffs. So the sheriffs in a county jail would be the uh, branch, you could say, of law enforcement. That is the correction staff in the jail. And what I realized by working with law enforcement is that, you know, they're people just like you and me. You know, it kind of, um, by demonizing law enforcement as a whole and overgeneralizing them, kind of dehumanizes them. It makes them seem like they have these superhuman powers. But what I realized when working with a lot of uh, law enforcement and being somewhat cordial with them, you know, shooting the breeze, small talk and whatever, that, you know, these people, for the most part, are there to just do their job. Now, are you going to run into some law enforcement that is assholes? Yes. Are you going to run into some law enforcement that actually is compassionate and cares about the inmates and want to help them out, you'll find that as well. Are you going to run into law enforcement that's kind of apathetic? They're not super jerks or they're not super compassionate, but they're somewhat apathetic. They're just there to do their job. You will find a healthy mix of all three of these people in my experience in working with law enforcement. Because keep in mind, I didn't work with the city law enforcement. I only worked with corrections officers and pro um, probation officers and actually overwhelmingly my experience working with these deputies just in this one department um, the reentry department of Santa Rita County Jail I actually had an overall positive experience with these deputies in the um, transition center and I actually found that most of these deputies actually were compassionate they did want to help out they were really trying to connect the inmates with the reentry resources upon their discharge from jail. So pretty much positive things to say about those deputies in the reentry center in Santa Rita jail. Okay, now how was it working with probation? Same thing, you know, some probation officers were kind of, you know, very abrasive, you know, they, they demanded respect. You could say they were kind of not very nice people. But on the other hand, there was a lot of probation officers that actually, you know, if I had a concern with one of my clients and I wanted some backup or I wanted to counsel with them, some probation officers were very good at reaching back to me and making sure we we're setting up clients for success. 
Some were kind of non-responsive. And some were kind of doing too much. But that's kind of like at any job. You're going to have some people that are nice, some people that don't care, and some people that are, are compassionate. So actually working with law enforcement really changed my opinion and kind of caused me to stop generalizing law enforcement as a whole. You know, although, you know, you could argue that the system is broken as a whole. So by simply you working for law enforcement, that makes you a jerk, you know. You know, that's a argument that uh, carries some legitimacy. And don't by any means think I'm giving law enforcement a pass for any inappropriate or criminal behavior. So just because I'm saying that this experience helped me humanize police, it helped me understand them as people and get a different perspective, don't think for a second that I'm giving them a pass on things such as, you know, them conducting criminal activity, you know, them shooting uh, unarmed and innocent people, them stopping you on the street for no reason, them, uh, you know, planting drugs on you and sending you to jail or um, working for the gangs in jail and bringing in contraband into the jails and prison. I am by no means excusing any of that type of behavior. I think any type of law enforcement should be held to the same standards of the law as anybody else who would commit the same crime. And I will admit that at many times, majority of the time, law enforcement is not punished as hard as the normal person would be punished for the same crimes. But then again, like I said, this job opened my eyes up and made me realize, hey, not all cops are bad people. And that's just something that I wanted to um, touch on and bring to light, you know, because I do find that, you know, people who have never dealt with really law enforcement, never been locked up, worked in the jails, they kind of have this one dimensional view of law enforcement, like F them all, F the cops, F all of them. And it kind of just shows the ignorance, you know, where if you were to talk about someone in the criminal justice system, you know, they'll tell you there's some cops who are cool. And then there's even some cops who are cool because they work with them to bring in contraband. They, they, um, essentially part of the gang. So that's a whole element that people forget about. And, you know, a lot of these, you know, you could call a gangster correction officer. These members of law enforcement could be highly respected by the inmates. And then the, uh, the, uh, argument that F the cops and all of them kind of goes out the water because the issue is not a binary or black and white issue. It is a very uh, complex and multidimensional issue. So overall, do I think that this program was a positive? I think definitely here in the Bay Area, it is a positive. Housing is so expensive, even though the program couldn't solve everybody's problems, you know, it is a step in the right direction. And just the fact that we are providing way more services than we were before due to this AB 109 bill, you know, whether the intention behind it was genuine or not, it is helping reduce the recidivism rate of people coming out with nonviolent felonies. And, you know, I do give props to the state for taking less punitive measures on those committing nonviolent felonies or those committing non-violent um, drug felonies. Is the system perfect? No. Is the criminal justice system or the nonprofit or social services um, system perfect? No. Is there bad players in the game? Yes. Are some of them corrupt? Yes. But it's not all of them. I don't think it's fair to generalize all social services and law enforcement into one bucket overall. Just like I said, how San Francisco is starting to address some of these homelessness issues the state of California is beginning to address how are we going to help those inmates, nonviolent inmates, at least at this time, come out and reintegrate into society. I think that is a positive thing. I think it's something that's more needed. I think it's something that the state is just starting to recognize and hopefully they will continue to fund and expand and create more legitimate reentry services so that not everybody is getting caught up in the criminal justice system for some BS. And they do have a chance, you know, once they complete their terms of probation to be a productive member of society, you know, change their life around if they're, they're, the life they were li living led them down the wrong path. 
So that was just a basic, basic overview of what it was like to work in the jail. I'll do another video about the jail because I kind of just skimmed the surface. But that's it for today. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Happy New Year. Uh, be safe. Please don't drink and drive, y'all, you know, because you could be the one ending up drinking and driving, getting that DUI, getting booked into county jails, and then you would be the one seeing someone like me for re-entry services. So please stay safe. Don't drink and drive. Happy New Year. Let's make this a great decade since we got the new 2020 decade. And that is it. I'm out, Isaac, reporting live to y'all for the Unorthodox Social Worker, live from the Fillmore District in San Francisco, California. Have a good one. Peace out, y'all.